Hello, welcome everybody. Um, our numbers keep jumping up, so I know some folks are gonna keep coming in this evening. Um, tonight, we have our presentation on how to research the history of your house. It is our final webinar of 2023. We'll be back in the spring and we're super happy to wrap it up um, with this one because it's such a fun one. Uh, we are recording tonight and we are also streaming live on Facebook right now. After uh, we're finished this evening, we'll have this posted on Facebook. We'll also eventually have it posted on our website. And also, we'll be sending out a follow-up email to everybody who registered for this evening that's going to have a link to this. Um, so you can get directly to this video if you want to see it again, because I'm sure you're going to want to go back and look at all the awesome tips Emily's going to give you tonight. Um, it's also going to have... Um, you know, some other things that are going on with us. We'll have a link. We have our 2023 wall calendar is now available for purchase. It's got kids drawings this year. So we're really excited about it. It is wonderful to behold. So we'll have a link for that. So you can purchase that as well in the follow-up email. Uh, we also have a newsletter going out tomorrow. So it'll be in there as well. If you're a member, you'll automatically also get our newsletter. If you're not a member, you should be. So give us a call at the office. Um, we are saving all of our Q&A for after Emily presents this evening. She'll be talking for about 45 minutes, and then the rest of the time we're going to have um, up until 7 p.m. where you guys can ask any questions that you have. So just try and hold on to those. Um, you can put them in the uh, Q&A section below. The chat is disabled. Please don't put anything in the chat or try to. I'm not even sure that you can. Um, but the Q&A is where it's at. So go ahead and drop anything you need in there. Um, let's see, I think that's about it. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Emily Walrath schmidt She has a master's degree from the School of the Art Institute in Historic Preservation. Uh, she's our preservation program manager. She's our grants guru, and uh, she's one heck of a researcher. So uh, very excited to see this. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, so go ahead and take it away. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. We know you have a lot of options, uh, especially with your TV, probably right next to your computer. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and uh, wish us luck. We're doing some live web demos, so those can get dicey. All right, here we go. We want this one. Did I do it, fam? Nope, hold on. That's not it. One more time. Um, this. Emily, I this. see it. I just also see. Uh, this screen. is what we want. That's it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, Here we go. We do see right. tabs up top, though, if there's a way you want to enlarge that, just so you know. Um, I want to do this. Let's start from the beginning. The best place to start. All right. Perfect. So you're in the right spot. Carla did that. We went over uh, all the little housekeeping bits and pieces. Um, we will be sharing links later, so don't feel like you have to jot down every link. There will be several. Um, and it's not just bungalows anymore. So if you are in a multifamily, um, any kind of house, uh, you are welcome here. If you're renting, if you're owning, these tips and tricks will work for you. Even if you're trying to research a business, actually, that would probably, you can apply this to that too. So we're happy you're here. Uh, the who, what, when, why of your house, you know, your house is not um, noteworthy or historical from a historic preservation standpoint necessarily, um, but there's so much you can find out about it. It doesn't have to be the best and highest example of anything to be special and wonderful and worthy of your research. So we're going to answer all those questions tonight and with your ongoing research. Um, so if you came here for your architect, your builder, your occupants, style, you know, when it was modified, when it was built, your neighborhood development in general, uh, we can we can definitely help you uh, uncover those those nuggets. Um, now, the how is what we're going to talk about. Um, so, if you lived in a house like that had a name, um, you could use secondary sources to research your home. Most of you here probably do not. So, we're going to go back to the primary resources. So those are documents that are created during the time your house was built and lived in before you got there. Um, you know, the building permits, the deeds, census data, newspaper records, all that really fun stuff um, that we're lucky enough to have in Chicago totally digitized in many capacities. So this is our kind of our journey plan for the 
for the night, six simple steps to get you started on your research. We'll go through them one by one. And I don't wanna rush, but I do have a lot of meaty content. So um, let's get started. Now, word of caution, you might fall down rabbit holes of research. So before you begin, have an organization plan for what you find. Um, there's this research worksheet on the website. You don't have to use it, but it's a good thing to be like, this is what I wanna find. This is where I found it. And you know, go from here, flesh it out. Um, because otherwise you could have a crazy looking notebook and um, have no idea where you found something that you wanna go back to. Uh, now, anytime you start researching a building, I always start with the pin and the year built. Uh, you can find the, the pin, that's a property index number on the assessor site. If you own your home, uh, you pay your taxes, so you probably know your pin. Um, but it's easy to do, you know how to use a website, go in there, type in your address, find your pin, find your the age of your building as well. Um, can you see my cursor if I move it? Hope so. Um, the, you know, yeah, Emily, you can oh, see, you super, can see. Sorry. super duper. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Um, the age of the building is important um, to have at least a, a frame. This isn't always 100% accurate. Uh, sometimes they're a year or two off, sometimes they're more, uh, but it's a great starting point to know what steps you need to take next. So don't skip this, do this first. Okay, so um, the reason is because in 1909, the streets were renumbered in Chicago. Um, so you can see how drastically an address could change. Uh, you know, 1348 Graceland Avenue or 1016 West Irving Park Road, that's the same building that's right next to Holiday Club uh, in Uptown. Um, same address, very different things. There's a way, an easy way to look this up though. Uh, so if you are have an older building, you know, you wanna know if this affected your address. Um, why were they renumbered? Well, of course, uh, Chicago in 1835 was a lot smaller than it is today. This map here shows the different um, area annexed. So you can imagine that 1890 was kind of a, a big lift um, for street numbers. So they, they decided in 1909 that they needed to do something about it. I'm not gonna play this now, but our, uh, I'm a big fan of um, Dilla Thomas's TikTok and his videos explaining things. He's got a great one on annexation. Okay. So if you want to find an old and new house number for your street, the Chicago History Museum has a great resource that they have online. Um, you can click the link and, and find this document, a great primary resource, and um, compare and contrast old and new numbers. It's alphabetical street. This is another one that they have uh, for street name changes. This was compiled, I think it's so cool, it was compiled in 1948, so uh, not as long as we are now from when it happened. Um, so if you once again have an older building, you wanna, you wanna do this step. Um, that example that I shared earlier, here we are, you know, in the document with the name changes, this is explaining that. And in the document with the um, street, old and new street numbers, that's the, the correlation. So this affects you, use this as an example to get started. Um, okay, now, maybe you knew, maybe you didn't know, starting in the 1880s, um, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map Company published these very detailed neighborhood by neighborhood maps, and they were for insurance reasons, so you know they were pretty accurate, because they needed to know what to charge you for your insurance rate based on how fireproof you're building. Um, so they were updated through 1951, which is the coolest part because for some areas you can see a moment in time like 1923 and then another moment in time 1950. Um, so you can see how your building changed as well as what it looked like originally. Not looked like, well, looked like, we'll get there. Um, and it includes building uses, building materials, changes, additions, and they are available online to the Chicago Public Library site. You can also go in person, of course, um, but if you have a library card, you can do this tonight after the webinar. Now, the maps that have been digitized are huge, so I just want you to keep this in mind as you're going through from your little laptop how big and beautiful and meaty uh, these original plat maps are. And as you can see here, when things changed and they would 
modify and update the, the book, they would literally paste over the top so you can see if there are changes in layers from um, what you find there. Now, so beautiful key, as well as a larger blog explanation online that I refer to a lot uh, that details out what all the colors and doodads and hieroglyphs mean. Um, I'm going to show you some examples here and then we're going to do a live demo. Um, but just know that this exists and you'll be able to translate all the crazy markings that you find. Um, so here's an example on uh, Euclid 7436 South Euclid Avenue. We're going to be looking at this building right here. Uh, it's a plan view. So here's the Google map. You can see it's pretty much still in the same uh, footprint as it was. The garage is obviously different. Um, but if we compare and contrast, let's take a look and see what this Sanborn map is telling us. Okay, there we are, up close, personal. And the A, that is about building use. So for D is dwelling, A is auto garage. Uh, if you have older buildings, you can see carriages, you know, that it was actually for horses, you'll, they'll say that there. If you're looking at commercial buildings, they'll kind of um, detail out um you know what the building was you'll find like dairies within the neighborhoods and boundaries and all kinds of crazy stuff um but for houses this is typically what you see uh you also have a have the building construction this one was brick and frame uh that pinky ready color means brick uh solid brick and the the yellow is wood lovely important for fire insurance um the the numbers denote building height. So most of our bungalows are one and a half stories. That means they have a full first story and then a, you know, not a full, like an attic in top. And that typically means that they were uh, unfinished and unoccupied as well when you see one and a half. And the B means basement. Obviously we also have basements. Um, if a porch is a different height, if it's not, you know, two, it's not a story and a half, they'll say that. Um, sometimes you'll find, you know, two story porches, just whatever you got, they denote it that way. Uh, these little dots, I love these. These talk about the roofing material. Once again, important for fire. Uh, composition is what you see in most bungalows. They're uh, the predecessor to the asphalt shingle. And they were pretty new on the scene when the bungalow boom happened. So that's pretty great. If you have a tile roof, that'll also show that. So there's, there's different, um, different dots mean different things refer to your key. Uh, the solid line, dotted lines, this was an open porch in the back. You can see it's dotted. The front was an enclosed porch. So it's like that. So if you're wondering why that room in the back of your house is super drafty, despite it being, you know, drywalled, it's probably because it was formerly an open porch that was enclosed, but by somebody's uncle in the 70s. Okay. Um, this means frame gables. So once again, materials inform fireproofness. If you have frame or wood gables, you'd want to know that, which is great because roof lines change. So this can be a great look back um, at what was there. And then uh, lastly, these are there on purpose. They are not doodles. That eight, it's an eight, not an infinity sign. It's an eight. It means eight inches thick. And this X, um, with one line through it means that there are windows, window openings on the first floor. So a lot of great info here, um, just waiting for you to discover in your sweatpants. Ah, and this is Michelle Obama's childhood home. Uh, the Robinson family owned it until recently. How do I know that? Because I went to the Cook County Assessor site and clicked on the access in-depth information and found that the Barack uh, Obama Foundation bought it recently from the Robinson family. Pretty cool. Okay, here's another example of how uh, borns can be really in understanding the development of your building. Lovely gambrel roof bungalow. If you look at it in 1923, there are two maps, one from 1923, one alone on its block, sturdy little, wait, one and a half story with a basement. Hmm. Huh. When we look at 1951, we see the block is definitely built up, certainly, but the house looks quite a bit different. You can even see here how it looks like it's been pasted over a bit. Wild. Well, if we compare them side by side, we see that that 
full second story with the gambrel roof was not original. It was added sometime between 1923 and 1951, as well as the garage and the neighbors. Um, and they also added some frame um, and uh, I don't know what's happening with this porch. I think they may have just changed conventions there. Um, but you can see that certainly it was not original and certainly um, it happened between these two dates. So that's a, just a quick example of how useful these can be in determining changes to your building. And we'll talk about researching through newspaper records in a little bit, but this tracks with trends that were going on um, in Chicago. This is from 1944, um, and it shows how they were encouraging people to create uh, small apartments above their homes to help out with the war housing shortage. So pretty cool. I don't know if you have these in your neighborhood. I have some in mine, and um, I never look at them the same since I learned this history. Now let's do a quick demo. Stick with me. I'm a historian, not a tech person. So, all right, we can still see my screen now. All right, so the Chicago Public Library, oh, I gotta log in. I was logged in, logged me out. There we go. Easy peasy, mac and cheesy, here we go. Um, sorry, I have young children. So some of my jokes are very infantile. Um, okay, we have down here, in their history and social science section, this wonderful link called Illinois Fire Insurance Maps Online. Click on it. You'll see the Sanborn map below it. That's a little, that's not 101. This is 101, go here. And it will take you, allegedly, oh, it's thinking about it, to this page. Choose interactive map and type in this teeny tiny little bar, type in your address. Um, I'm gonna do 4837 North Kenmore. We're gonna go, this is an uptown. Ah, and you can see the options we have for the Sanborn maps. There's a couple. Now the building I'm gonna be researching um, was not there in 1890. I knew that because I looked up the pin earlier and the age of the building, um, but it is, should be there after 1905. So let's click on this one and start there. Now, you're like, whoa, that's not a map. That's just a blank screen. Before you start, go to page zero over here, click on the sheet and zoom in. And this is where you can find the page number. So each of these beautiful little quilts have um, its own page. And I know that my building um, is at Lawrence and Kenmore. So it's right here on this side of the street. So I'm gonna go to page. Now, if I was looking somewhere else or if I was on, you know, sometimes a street is split into different pages, just know what side of the street you're on. And then we come back over here after, of course, I download it for my records. I come back to this side and I can go all the way to page number three. And then here we are, let's zoom in. Ah, lovely. You can see that in 1905, it wasn't entirely finished as a block, um, but here's the building that I'm looking up. Now this says 2070, not 4837, but since I already did my research and I looked at my street renumbering, I know that this is the old street number. Sometimes you'll walk around your neighborhood and you'll see those um, like, you know, stained glass street numbers that don't match. This is why, but um, so yeah. So if I look at this, I'd wanna download it as a JPEG. And then I have a really beautiful high resolution um, record that I can pour over with my key and uh, learn everything I didn't know I needed to know, um, you know, about my building. Okay, good, moving along. And if there were more editions that covered it, I would go back and I'd look at all of them and see how it had changed, but this is just a demo folks. Okay, um, next. It's so weird not being able to see your faces by the way, cause like in a room full of people, I'd know if people are nodding along and now I don't. So I'm just plowing through. Uh, we're going to talk about building permits. Um, this is just as exciting as Sanborn maps. Um, they've been required since the fire of um, 1871. So 1872 on, 
Um, they've been required for new buildings as well as additions. They're newly digitized, well, not newly, they're digitized by UIC um, and they are a wealth of information. Um, they go up through 1954 and after 1954, um, they, are, they are digital after that. Yes, yes, okay. Um, Carla did me that um, if you go to um, the Chicago History Museum, a librarian we love can help you with this. I'm gonna show you how to do this from your couch. Once again, um, I'm a lazy historian, so I like to do as much as I can from home. Um, so let's just see what you can learn on there and then I'll show you just like with the Sanborn maps, how to actually do this. Um, so the building permits are, um, they're not big as you can see, here's an example right here. They show you the owner at the time of construction, which may not be the first you know, occupant of your building, but the owner, the date of the application for the permit, which is generally within a few weeks of the start of construction. Um, that's architect if there is one for your building, contractor, uh, estimated construction costs, which are wild, uh, also probably inaccurate because you pay taxes or um, I'm sorry, you know, fees based on how much it costs. So people underestimate. And then of course, progress of construction. If there are issues, um, there's like a little report. Now, this is a two-part system. So there is an index card and then the building permit on a, on a ledger. They're on microfilm. They were microfilmed at one point. And um, the online tool replicates these roles um, you know, as if you are in front of a micro fiche reader. Uh, so just it's not for the faint of heart. Um, this is what I just mentioned. There's the, the building file card, just like, you know, the library of yesteryear, you get the file card and then that helps you find the book. You get the building file card and then you can find the permit in the book. Uh, so you have to do both steps um, and don't just try to find the permit without this first step, you will go cross-eyed. Um, so, you know, this has the address on there as well as the permit number, those match. This is the book that you'll find it in. I'll mention that again in a minute. The date of the permit. If you're doing this online, you need to look it up by date, not permit number or page number because the page numbers are not visible when you're in the film. Once again, this will make sense in a moment. You need to hear things a few times before you absorb them anyway. Um, so it's a two-step process. Let's show you why am I here? Ah, there we are. Um, and this, is the building permit. And this is what it looks like when it's on the big book page. So there are multiple um, files, I'm sorry, permits per page, um, which makes this even more exciting. Now, I had mentioned you can find this, these bits of information. Um, they are handwritten. So uh, brush off your cursive ancient cursive skills. There's a wild range of legibility as well, um, you know, from penmanship as well as the record itself. Um, you know, some are, are illegible and that's just tough luck, um, but you can, you can try and see what you can find. Um, so, you know, owner, architect, contractor, number of stories, uh, brick or frame, that's kind of cool. The cost is down here. And then the final report, that's the, you know, when you know it was certainly completed. So it was filed in October of 1914. It was completed in February 15. That's pretty quick. Um, and this once again is my favorite little bungalow here. Um, and this is just the information typed out from the building permit. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever tried your hand at this, had any luck. I Love it, um, but can take a lot of time. Okay, um, so let's just look at this process in real time. Um, so if you click the link, this is the university's um, landing page. There's an explanation written here, a step-by-step -step on how to do it. Uh, I, I need to have it shown to me. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So click the green browse building permit button. Wait for your internet to take you there. Then the first step, we need to look at that card. So we go to the building street index. All right. So, woo, alphabetical order by street. So we're going to look up that bungalow on South Euclid Avenue. 
Uh, so I'm going to go to the ease and click on this one, right? That checks out. Click right there. Then it opens it up in a digital reel. So wild. Now, as you can see, this is page one of 4,737. Um, that's a lot of reels. What I like to do is, you know, type into this middle of the road, see where we end up. Um, like let's, you know, 2000, page 2000, let's go halfway through and see what street address we're on. Oh, we're on Erie. So if you go one by one by one, you will need too many snacks. You will not finish your project. You can also view the film this way. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag. You know, I'm the only one home. I don't know why uh, this internet isn't going here. Um, hmm. Well, I know what page it's on. This just looks like a reel of film um, because I did my homework ahead of time. Um, but just know that you can enter in to this page number and then it will take you there. Hopefully this shows up for us. Clear as mud. What if I click on one? Let's see here. Pull up for me. Okay, here it is. So, um, 7436, great. It's permit number. I can't read that, can you? Page 606 in the 11th uh, book south. Thankfully, this number is super legible. So, what I do is I'd, um, you can enhance it if you want. Great. Is that easy to read? I don't know. But download it as a JPEG or what your file of choice. And then you can reference this. Um, so, once you've found it, and like I said, you know, going through one by one, it's pretty arduous, but doable um, and fun. <laughs> you can find it. Now, once you have that information from your card, go back. Here it is, go back and go back. Oh. I hope, uh, I hope the internet isn't too crazy here. And then now you can go back to the ledgers. So index first, now the ledgers. And this is where you gotta clear your head and look in because these are done. These are organized by date and then north and south. So wrap your head around the date that that permit was uh, filed and then keep scrolling until you see it. Um, once again, I did this ahead of time because my brain wouldn't be able to read this right now. Um, we're book 11. And oh, that's good. That's south. Remember that 11S? And the dates on this file are between November of 13 and October of 14. Great. For October of 14. Let's click on this. Okay. Fingers crossed. It's our file. Let me get to another digital reel. Oh, lovely. This one's actually playing up. This one's only 316. Um, so I'm not gonna go, once again, I don't like to go through one by one, though it's kind of cool to see it. Um, I would type in a number, see where I'm, um, I know this is on page 315 of this one. Um, and once you get here, then you gotta start zooming in until you can actually read something. I hope this is coming across on Zoom okay. Um, can you read it? Can you read it? Oh, here we are, 7436. Keep zooming until you get to it. Oh, great. Oh, super. And there's our building permit. It has, oh, a report. Oh, there was a complaint. There's some really great stuff to dig into here. Um, you can, you know, clip just the permit you, oh, that's not what I wanted. Click just the permit you want, you can download it, um, save it forever, print it out, wallpaper your bathroom with it, whatever you want. Um, but then you have some real good hard evidence about when your building was built, who did it. And um, these are great leads for further research. You know, who is this architect? Who is this contractor? Sometimes they have like, you know, other folks listed. Um, Sometimes you'll find in your neighborhood, like everybody, there was a you know developer who owned everything. So these are 
leads for further research. Or you can stop here and pat yourself on the back. Um, so, okay. So I hope that was legible from your couch. Um, moving along. Now, if you live in a historic district, somebody already did this for you, probably Carla. Um, and there are 14 bungalow historic districts. There are 109 other or total districts in the city. So even if you're not in a bungalow district, you might be in another district. Um, and there's a way to look it up. Uh, this is a city GIS map. Uh, just make sure you know you're clicking uh, districts, national register district um, right here, not uh, landmark district. So you're probably not in the landmark district, otherwise you'd know that already. Um, the difference between districts is a conversation for another day. Um, okay, now the national register, if you are in a district, there's a form and which is like a history report compressed into a government form. Um, but if your house is in it, you have the information from your building permit there. So I wanna mention it. There's also some fun, you know, narrative descriptions about it. They're, they, they're great reads, they just look terrible. Um, here's another example with the information from the national register form instead of the building permit itself. Um, so can save yourself a step. Of course, if you wanna go find the building permit, you can go do that. Um, if this isn't cool enough for you and you want that, you know, historical document, go ahead. Let me just let you know there's a shortcut for some folks. Um, this is a map showing a district. Sometimes, just want to mention this, you might be in a district, but your house might not be contributing in the district. Um, people want to know about this. We can talk about this, but I'm going to keep moving on here. Okay, deeds. Um, you own your home, you have a deed for your house. Everyone who's ever owned your home has had a deed. Uh, it's a great way if you trace back the deeds to know everybody who owns your house. Um, landmarking, official or capital P preservation landmarking requires a chain of title. Um, so you don't have to do it. It can be interesting. Um, it can be helpful to determine when changes and additions were done because you know, just like today, if you buy a house, you might wanna make your mark on it. So it can kind of give you a uh, timeframe for when to look for changes. Um, the Cook County website has digital copy, copies back to 1985. Older than that, you got to go downtown. If you do that, um, uh, you got to have your PIN number with you, but you already researched that. And then, um, you know, you, if you have your legal description, have that with you because that can be a big help. Um, it's a long process that also involves microfilm, uh, but there are the people that work there are lovely and um, they're very nice. This is this is what you see if you want to get back to 1985 through the um, record record of deeds search. Um, this is the yeah. So this is just an example of that. Um, this is the building, City Hall, um, county building that you have to go into the basement of and um, bring cash, bring a snack. Uh, bring some water um, and just get your hands dirty. But if you really want to do this, you can, and this is how. Now, um, gets more fun when you can identify who lived there, not just who built it, who owned it, but like who lived there. Census records are a treasure trove of information, and they don't just you know, list the household head or whoever happened to own the building. They actually list you know women, children. <laughs> other people. Um, so, and they have their occupations, where they were born, if they're married or not, um, where they work, if they work. So you can really kind of find great stuff out. If you've done this um, for your own genealogy, it's the same process. You can look anybody up um, and they're done by neighborhoods. You can kind of look at them and see like, oh, where are people from the neighborhood? Where were they born? Illinois and Italy for this one, Germany down there. Uh, so it's just it further tells the story of um, who's lived in your house. Um, the easiest way to do it, just go to ancestry.com. Um, there you can access census records, but that is beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, so if you go to ancestry.com, you can type in some of those names that you know and uh, who lived there and when. Now, you don't know who lived there. Who do, how do I look up a name in the census ancestry portal? Well, one of the quickest ways to do it uh, is through city directories. So if you're old enough, you remember the phone book where um, you know someone's name, you can look up their address and phone number. 
Well, in the past, they used to have what's called a crisscross directory where they list the addresses and you can look up who lived there. So there's a really great one from 2000, 2000 whew, 1928 through 1929 um, that you can access online. There's also hard copies with librarians to help you um, at these places. Uh, so pick your poison. Um, this is your typical historic directory. You can see it's listed by last name. Not helpful if you don't know who lives there, but a crisscross directory lists the street name and then the, the number and who lived at the address, including, you know, women. Wow. They list them out too, as well as that O after name means that they're an owner of a building. So you can assume that they're a renter if there isn't an O next to their names. Uh, now there isn't one of these for every year. If your house wasn't built by the time this was done, sorry, you have to try another avenue. Um, but this is a great thing if your house was built by 1929. Okay, I was gonna do, but keeping an eye on our time, let's keep moving. Um, click this link, it'll take you to that uh, PDF and you can, you know the alphabet, you can find the name of your street by yourself. Okay, um, now this is one of my favorites. They're all my favorites, I'm sorry. Um, newspapers, there are so many wonderful things you can find in the newspaper records. And they've, a lot of them have been digitized, including the Chicago Tribune um, and other smaller papers. And you can access them for free in your sweatpants on Chicago Public Library's site. Um, before you do this, though, you've been warned, you might find something weird or wild or macabre. So if you don't want to know, don't go looking for it. Um, okay. Now, we looked at the sandboard map for this address. You can see in 1891, they were um, you know, selling the land. Oh, how, how nice. By 1906, it's built. Um, it describes the dining room windows overlooking the lake. Oh, how fun. Um, 1922, we have a garage you could rent that was newly built there. All right, cool. You can kind of see the evolution of the property through the newspapers. Um, then in 1915, things take a dark turn. Um, I nearly fell out of my chair when I found this. I was living in this apartment at the time. Um, that this cook who worked there and presumably lived there as well um, committed suicide on the grave of her son exactly one month after his untimely death and, um, you know, made arrangements for the care of their graves. And because the internet is super weird and wild, you can find a picture of their grave and you can see um, and just have this weird connection to someone who lived and not died in your house, but died. And um, so you just never know what you're gonna find, never know. Now, time marches on and by 1919, they were looking for another Hungarian cook. Um, so it's a beautiful, sad full circle moment. Okay. Um, now you can also hit the jackpot and find an interior art, an article about the interior of your house from a major renovation. Um, this is an art teacher who in the summers would paint murals and modernize his home. Um, you know, just a reminder that everything looks hopelessly outdated when it's about 20, 25 years old. So this is from 1949, this bungalow wasn't that old. He went ahead and took out the fireplace, put in a big mirror and added an arabesque arch as well. So, you know, you can find weird stuff, but also trends can help you find out trends about general things. Um, this one uh, is another one uh, with this whole modernization it was sound but outdated at 23 years old. So the, the owner put in this crazy modern look. So you can get lucky and find stuff. Um, most of the time, however, when you search the newspaper records, you're gonna find things like, um, you know, real estate listings, old real estate listings, but real estate listings that kind of describe your house, um, which is really nice and cool. Um, so let me just show you one here, 24. So we'll just do 24, 23 West Coil. So once again, we're at our favorite, what my favorite website, uh, they're a bunch of newspaper, all are digitized. Go down to the Tribune. I always start there and then I get, you know, go on from there. But you can enter 
key, key, um, wow, what am I trying to say? 24, 23 West Quail, okay. So, you know, do as few words as possible to start, see what you find. Okay, so something from 1985, not really what I'm looking for. Ah, let me try taking out the direction and seeing if that gets me some more. Nothing there. Thought I'd try this one out. Well, we'll try a different one. I wish there was somebody in the chat. Let's do something weird. Let's do um, 3837 Kenmore. This is why you should never do live demonstrations on a webinar. Anything can happen. Huh. Well, this isn't working very well tonight. Add in. What I really want to show you is just that this exists and that you can search with it. When you do the searches, use lots of different types of types of um, numbers. You know, try the address with the direction, try it without. You can also put names into here. Once you know the name of somebody who lived there and find you know, more information about the occupants, um, you can try intersections. You know, if you know the architect or the builder, you can look them up in here. Um, so I don't know why this isn't humming for me tonight, but know that this is a resource for you. You can use it um, and spend as much time as you like going back in time. Oh, my date. Thank you, Carla. Carla is great. Apparently I had a date in there. So, okay. But yeah, so moving on, we don't have time anyway. Now, most additional questions people have are about photos, blueprints, what's the original, what's the style of my house? Um, photos can be found as we just saw in newspapers. Your best bet, however, is gonna be with neighbors or former owners. You can go on ancestry.com and contact old relatives to find it. Um, maybe somebody has, uh, you know, an old timer on your block has some with your house in the background. That can be a great way to go. There are collections online, uh, you know, access those if you'd like to. Um, you also may have a local historical society in your neighborhood. Uh, it varies wildly throughout the city what they have. Uh, so just, you know, get local. Um, and try to find them. I know you want to find these beautiful basement window shots, the cute family in the front, look at that gorgeous built-in. I mean, come on, people. And then, uh, you know, idyllic kids playing on the streets. You want your house in that background. I know you do. Um, so you might find it, but also you might not. But you can leave tonight and go find a historic map of your house, um, the building permit of your house, and get some really good information. Um, now, I once hit the jackpot. Um, using Google Books. If you go into Google Books or Google, just start trying every possible combination and you might find something about your architect or your intersection or your, you know, don't, don't count on like just your address. But if you know more about who built it, who lived there, uh, you know, you can find this. So I found this from National Builder, a two-page article about the construction of my subdivision. I live in Portage Park. We live in a frame um, bungalow street. There's two and a half blocks of these. And um, it's just wild. My house, of course, is not visible, but there's like sample floor plans. And, you know, I was eating lunch, nearly choked on my pizza. Um, and like, this isn't my house, but this is that house from that article, still standing, modified, but barely. Um, so you can get lucky to say. Um, if you're looking for blueprints, repository for blueprints. Um, if you know their architect or your contractor, you might be able to find an archive of them, uh, of theirs, and there might be blueprints. Um, you don't need blueprints, though, to know old features of your house, just go into your neighbors. Um, or you can learn a lot just from moldings and doorknobs and different other keys. Once again, can't teach you how to do that tonight, but uh, if you have further questions, we can dig in. You want to know what's original? Um, like as I said, get to know your neighbors. Chances are somebody has something intact that you're that you're looking to replicate. Um, you can at least get inspiration for a likely feature. There were trends back then, just like there were trends now. Just think in 50 years, everybody's going to be totally wondering about the barn doors and the shiplap 
like why that is everywhere. Um, maybe they'll want to preserve it. I digress. Uh, this website has some great color schemes and examples um, of what's original if you're trying to do that. There's also, if I'm having a bad day, I go here to this builder's catalog from 1928. Um, they have great examples of, you know, interiors, floor plans. Even if this isn't your exact house, it can be a great, you know, inspiration for you to figure out what was original and what was not. Um, there's also uh, like not just building plans but building bits catalog that you can go through and like, oh my gosh, my mailbox, how did it work? Here's a diagram. Um, you can find some really interesting stuff in there. Link to that, dig deep friends, I think you'll like it. Um, if you wanna know the style of your house, I'm really sorry you sat through this presentation because um, <laughs> there's some books that can help you determine that or us at the Bungalow Association. Um, we have examples on the our webpage, but also Carla and I would love nothing more than to tell you what style your house is, excruciating detail. Um, so do that. And here are a few parting thoughts before we start questions. I know I went fast, but um, you know, you can find links to do all this stuff in your own time. Um, just be persistent, be patient, be open. You don't know what you're gonna find or not find. New stuff is digitized literally every day all over the world. So if you're not finding anything now, try again in a year, maybe somebody digitized something, try those different search combos. Alternative spellings exist. People are not perfect now. They were not perfect then. Newspaper people did not double check name spellings. So just be flexible. Um, fun to think about contemporary events. What was shaping how people is ask a librarian for help. Um, if you are gonna go live or repository, check the hours and procedures ahead of time. You know, it's gonna take you longer than you think and you're gonna wanna take a pencil, not a pen. They won't let you take a pen in. And then keep those or orderly notes. Uh, you're going to want to reference it back and dig deeper. Um, and then please, people, include your own history. If you are researching and writing about the history of your home, like talk about you and who lived there and what you're up to, because you know it's hard now and you want to save somebody in the future um, sometime. So, okay, um, I am going to hand it back. Thank you for your attention. Um, how do I do this? I'm going to stop my share. Or Carla, do you want to get in here? Hop in. Hey, there's Carla. I'm in here. I'm here. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, if it's if it's beneficial to keep that up, if you need to look at anything. Um, yeah, we'll do that. Obviously. Um, let's see. Uh, you you cut out your you cut out just a little bit when somebody asked when you were talking about blueprints, and I know oh. people asked about that. So if you could just again just the beginning of that. Sorry, folks. Blueprints. There's no central repository of blueprints. Um, if they exist, they're in bad condition. There's no place to find them that I can tell you. Um, sometimes if you know the architect or the contractor, you might get lucky and find an archive that has their records or materials, um, but you don't need blueprints to know what your house might've looked like originally. I, I know blueprints are cool and fun and we love them, um, but if you can't find them and you probably won't, there are other ways to potentially help you find the information you're looking for. Talk to a preservationist. Or okay. hire an architect. Too. Or hire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you, you really want to hear yeah. yeah. Sorry about it. Yeah, I know. I had like a cross <laughs> through the blueprint and I was like, oh, that's too harsh because I know people want them. Um, but sorry. Look at those home building plans for, for typologies. Um, you know, you might find something very, very close um, that helps. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, we had a couple questions too about people wanting to know if they live in the suburbs, if this stuff will work for them. Um, I'm sorry, the suburb. If they live in the so suburbs. The, the Cook County stuff is, I should have mentioned that at the top. I'm sorry, Chicago. Um, Cook County records are for all of Cook County. Library um, probably has um, those same kind of resources, if they're digitized or not, I don't know. Um, but go in person to your local library and ask, you know, about it there. Um, some of this stuff can be very, very local. Um, but, you know, ancestry is for everybody. <laughs> same thing with, um, uh, you know, the internet, Google Books. So you might just have to get started a little bit different, but should work. Okay. 
Um, okay, uh, and I know you mentioned this, but just as a recap, since a lot of mm -hmm. people opt in late, um, if you don't have a PIN, can you access information about the history of your house? Yes. <laughs> um, so these are public records. Um, you can access the history about anybody's house. Um, you can look up anybody's PIN on the you know Cook County Assessor site. You can research any of this is open to anybody. Um, I'm not an ethics person, but you know, if you love your neighbor's house and want to know everything about it, there's nothing stopping you from researching it to the hilt. Um, so if if you're having a question about like you can't find your pin and you know your house, you own your house, you cannot find your pin, that maybe that's the question you have. Sometimes that site can be tricky um, and imperfect. Um, but email me, we'll do it later. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Okay. Next. <laughs> um, okay, Mary Lou Seidel, our good friend. Hey, Mary Lou, what's up? <laughs> um, she also said you were doing great. Um, <laughs> she said, um, what do you do when the card is illegible? And she typed that when we were doing building permits. Okay, so the building permit conundrum. There are little features in within that viewer on the UIC site that can tweak uh, for de-skewing, de-speckling, enhancing, um, sometimes doing a mirror image. So the black is white and the white is black can help you view it. Um, but sometimes if it's illegible, you are out of luck, friends. Um, the original building permits and cards were lost in a fire, Carla, do you know when? I don't know when. Um, so all that remains are those uh, micro wheels, which are faithfully, um, you know, digitized. So if you don't have it, you don't have it. And I'm very sorry. But there are other, as you saw, other avenues to try to fill in the gaps and get that information as close as you can. So it, it's frustrating. It be, I wonder, Emily, if you know too, if there are there, the microfilm reels are different at UIC, the physical ones at UIC. Okay. The physical ones at the History Museum. And sometimes maybe you get lucky. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's but, a great tip. You uh, could get lucky. Try other ones. Also, um, here I'm just the bearer of bad news today. Some houses are just missing. Um, you know, you'll have like a gap in the record. They're misfiled. So if you know you're in the right role, it can be helpful to go through, you know, the thing I was trying not to do go by record by record or um, image by image by image and see if it's just misplaced or miscategorized. But um, yeah, it's not perfect, but fingers crossed. Um, Especially if they're yeah. newer bungalows, we have a lot of luck with, but older yeah. stuff. The older stuff, if you're like, you know, 19th century stuff, uh, the building files are, they look different. They're crazy. They're not in like a square. They're like in a line, like a ledger. Um, people's handwriting is antique, um, but give it a try. <laughs> give it a try. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this is an interesting question, actually, from Laura Gonarelli, who I, I know from years back. Um, oh. What does it mean when you have an historic home? She has a plaque that says it was historic, but what does that mean? Okay, well, that's a great question. If you have one of our, so there's bungalow plaques that I just learned were given out, like their metal Chicago bungalow logo plaques that were given out in the early days um, to historic Chicago bungalows that met our definition of that. We don't do that anymore. We will not do that. Um, so if you have that, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Um, if you have like your traditional, you know, marker, um, typically that means that it's a local landmark. Um, you know, the city of Chicago landmarked it. I'm thinking of Alta Vista Terrace in um, Wrigleyville that has that cool plaque like on the street. Um, however, even if you are landmarked or in a district, uh, you like you can buy those. You could write your own little history and like make yourself a plaque. There's nothing that's stopping you from that. So email me the address and I will tell you how and why your house is historic. Um, but there are different levels of landmarking and recognition based on lots of different factors, including you know singularity, like is this the most unique example of the style? Someone who lived there was really maybe really important. Um, something crazy happened there or important happened there. So there's different reasons houses are considered historic besides just being old. Um, your house here, everyone is just probably old, but interesting nonetheless. Um, so historic is a complicated word. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this one really quick. Somebody okay. Else, uh, lives in Portage Park. Oh, hey, neighbor. In, um, which is an historic bungalow district. We mm -hmm. do there. Um, so they're asking what kind of research went into it. Just so you know. Um, oh, Carla, take this one. Use that designation. I didn't actually work on Portage Park. That one. Oh, that was, that was Lindsay Wallace. Yeah. Yep. And um, but we have yeah. the, um, we have the report we can send you. You mm -hmm. might be included as a property that's contributing in that district. Mm -hmm. You might not be. So you can find that out though from the report. And we can also tell you if you just give us our address, we're actually working on that right now. Yeah. So, um, uh, Tara, if you can just drop us an email, um, we will, we will get that to you. No problem. Um, uh, do the Sanborn maps include the Chicago suburbs? Um, so eh, some suburban communities are included, you know, um, they only go up through 1951, typically the 1950s. So, um, if your suburb is old, Yes, absolutely. You can find your maps. Um, actually, I think the Chicago site, um, the the Chicago Public Library site, might even have some of the surrounding areas. Um, you can find them in other cities, all over the country. Um, you know, typically all you need is a um, a Chicago Public Library card or, or or whatever public library to access them. Um, someone I see, Amanda, thank you. Um, there are Illinois ones freely accessible. They might not be, you might have to use a different way to search them and figure them out, but um, check them out there. Uh, the Chicago website is like so easy now that you can just look it up by address. Um, there used to be a whole other rubric to that. Uh, so um, send me your specifics and I will let you know if I can help you find them. Yeah, there are some uh, links some other people put in the in the Q&A too, if folks are curious. Also, just yes. a reminder that we are recording this. Everybody who signed up mm -hmm. tonight is going to get an email with the link to this. Um, we're also uh, live on Facebook. It'll be posted on Facebook after this, um, and we'll have it on our website. So we'll definitely have access to this. Um, Em, I know we're at 701. Do you want to take just a couple more? Yeah, I can take a few more questions. That? Okay. Yeah, if, if you hear screaming, yeah. it's just my kids, but that's fine. Oh, okay. We'll be done. Just no worries. No, I'm happy to stay a little bit. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, uh, does anyone offer consulting services to help you build the history of your home? Hmm. Yes, there are folks who do this. Um, I actually used to do this in North Carolina uh, for folks. I don't do it here now for money, um, but there are historic preservationists. I think... Um, I don't know where you find those folks. I feel yeah. like there is a one. Let us let's look up where to find them. Um, you know, hire the professional. Your money is going to good use if you'd like to hire someone to do this. And obviously, maybe you can tell people who love this, like love this. Um, so, you know, yeah, um, you connected with a professional. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, folks who are asking about tax bills, that's a little out of our range on this one. Just so you know. Um, there is a historic uh, tax incentive, um, which is a whole topic entirely. If you're in a national register district, you can get um, a property tax freeze if you do renovations and they follow certain standards. Um, if you wanna know more about that, I think I have an infographic I can share with you, um, but other topic entirely. Um, okay, well, we'll just take one more then. Uh, Thank you for your question, though. <laughs> and thanks, everybody. Yeah, um, there's so much to cover, and Emily mm -hmm. did an amazing job. There, this is just an endless topic. Your, de your deconstruction of the sandbar map was nothing short of brilliant, by the oh, way. Thank you. Um, it's a, but it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, somebody asked if uh, if you could also look up this kind of stuff for a business. So we'll just end with that. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, you know these businesses are actually a lot of fun because um, they're, you know, you'll find sometimes ads for business if you're doing it, if you're looking up newspapers, but all the steps for finding the pin, um, finding the age of the building, um, finding the building permit, um, that, you know, all of that stuff is um, the same. Um, once you know the name of a historic building, maybe you, or um, business, maybe you pulled it from the Sanborn map, um, maybe you found it in the newspaper, Googling the address, um, you know, then you can, sky is the limit with what you can find, or you might be unlucky and find nothing. Um, in that case, hire somebody. No, um, but you can find a lot just 
just Googling around and using these, um, these digitized resources. Absolutely. I, I would say also to find someone to help and hire you. Um, I think the state keeps a record of, uh, yeah, I feel like they of architectural story. And anytime we finish a National Register nomination, I think you're automatically listed in there. And there might yep. be other things too that list you there. So you mm -hmm. might want to call um, the State Historic Preservation Officer down, down in Springfield. Um, just look up the yeah State Historic Preservation Office and give them a holler and see if they can point you to some folks. They certainly know us all. It's a small crew, but um, uh, yeah. thank you, Emily. Again, we're going to send out a follow up email with uh, you know any links that were mentioned tonight mm -hmm. and the presentation, etc. Uh, don't forget to buy your 2023 calendar. We'll have a link for that too. Have wonderful holidays, everybody. Emily, thank you so much. Your genius. And I think that's it for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. See you on the internet.